Sorry, we're getting started a little bit late today. Um, we, we only have two sessions left, so we got to make sure we get started. So let's begin uh, right away with a word of prayer. Holy Spirit, as we celebrate the coming uh, of your presence into the lives of God's people, we pray that you would come into our presence now through this word that we study and hear and work in us that which you intend to accomplish. May you strengthen our faith and prepare us for uh, living godly lives so that we can be your witnesses uh, in our communities and in our families. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we are doing First and Second Peter today and also uh, the tiny little book of Jude. So let's go ahead and get started by looking at First Peter. Uh, a little overview first. First and Second Peter were written by the Apostle Peter. They are called Catholic epistles uh, because they were addressed to all Christians, both Jewish and Gentile Christians. And the word Catholic means universal. Uh, does anybody, is anybody old enough to remember when we used to say Catholic as part of the creed? Yes. Yeah, I don't remember if there was a big issue changing it at that time, but I think everybody at that time knew that Catholic meant universal. Uh, Peter's letters were especially written to those Christians who had been scattered due to persecutions. Let's go ahead and take a look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. There it says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Um, so, specifically not looking at the, the areas, but the elect exiles, uh, the elect would refer to those who have been predestined uh, by Christ and, and justified by Christ, um, the exiles of the dispersion. So these are ones who have been scattered. And I think we talked last time about the dispersion, the scattering um, during the time of the Babylonian captivity. So uh, we'll, we'll move on past that. But these are all of those uh, Jewish Christians who were scattered uh, at the timing of, of Stephen's stoning, and then they left and went to all different places throughout the, the empire, and of course they went to the places where there were already Jewish settlements. So in that way the, the gospel spread uh, throughout the world. Uh, Peter knew about persecution. He was in Rome when he wrote these letters. The Roman Emperor Nero had already begun persecuting and killing Christians in 64 AD. Historians say that Peter was killed in Rome around 68 AD. Therefore, this letter was probably written in 67 AD or early 68 AD. Uh, while uh, Peter wrote this from Rome, he may have been under arrest there, like Paul was, or he may have still been free. Um, so at this time, we don't know what his situation was. We do know how it ended. At some point, he was arrested and put to death uh, for being a follower of Jesus. Uh, as it says here, either way, shortly after writing these letters, he was martyred for his faith in Jesus. He wasn't alone. Many other Christians were being persecuted for their faith at that time as well. And uh, I'm pretty sure we've, we've talked somewhat at least, uh, maybe at length, about the kinds of persecutions that were taking place in Rome. Do we, do we uh, need to say any more about that? Would you like me to address that in any way? As you may be familiar uh, with the story, uh, Rome was, a significant portion of Rome burned. Um, and Nero, looking to deflect blame, because a lot of people think he actually said it, he was nuts, um, blamed Christians. And so that gave uh, license to begin hating Christians. And so after that, when Nero said, I know, let's start killing them, it had uh, at least tacit approval from the populace who, at least for a time, enjoyed uh, the, the bloodshed. Uh, lots of horrific things happened. I think most people are familiar with what happened in the Colosseum. Christians were forced to fight gladiators or uh, wild animals were set upon them. Other terrible things happened too. I won't get into all the details, but um, pretty rough time for Christians, at least in Rome, um, and then throughout the world, because Nero had made a decree that Christianity was an illegal religion. So at that point, anywhere else in the Roman Empire, Christians were um, at least being threatened with the possibility of persecution and death. Um, 
a lot of people really didn't care outside of Rome, you know, live and let live kind of thing. But if, if your neighbor didn't like you and you were a Christian, they could bring you up on charges of being a Christian and the local magistrate would be forced to act on it or then they lose their job. So um, it was certainly a challenging time for Christians when Peter wrote this. So keep that sort of in the back of your mind as we go through the rest of the letter. One of Peter's reasons for writing, therefore, was to encourage Christians to hang in there. Although God had not promised to spare them from persecutions, he did give them the promise of the resurrection. A promise that gives hope to all believers. Alright, let's let somebody else read this. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested geniusness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of jesus christ though you have not seen him you love him though you do not now see him you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory obtaining the outcome of your faith the salvation of your soul all right thank you it's a wonderful funeral text that really isn't taken advantage of by very many people, but a wonderful gospel revealed there that um, there is an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. So it's like it's in the most securest safety deposit box that ever was. So you don't have to worry about losing it. It is kept for you and waiting for you on the day that you inherit it uh, through death. Um, so good news that Peter shares with Christians there. Peter wanted Christians to know about these promises so that they would be prepared at all times to tell that good news to others. Uh, and then so would somebody else read, please, uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 13 to 17. Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. Okay, thank you. Uh, so once again, we see in a different chapter the, the continuation of the same idea to hang in there. Um, and here Peter says, uh, who can harm you uh, if you're zealous for doing good? Um, even if you do suffer, you'll be blessed. So have no fear of them. But then he goes on to say uh, something that's very important, that if those times should come, be prepared to give a testimony, to give a witness to the, the hope that you have in Christ. Um, so be at all times ready to give a defense of what you believe. Um, and that really goes back to the really root of the word martyr. Uh, martyr uh, from the Greek means witness, which is why it has become um, synonymous with people who die for their faith, um, specifically Christians, uh, because in their deaths, they give a testimony to how faithfully and fervently they believe what they're saying is true. This is what makes Christianity believable. The martyrs who suffered and died were eyewitnesses. They would know if the things that they said happened didn't really happen. So for them, it would have been foolish for them to go ahead and die when they know that it's for nothing. Uh, that's what makes Christianity much more believable than, say, uh, Islam. Islam has people willing to die for their faith, too, but they weren't eyewitnesses. There weren't any eyewitnesses. Every one of them was told this is what happened, and then they have to choose to believe it or not. 
the martyrs uh, in the first century anyway were, were eyewitnesses of what Jesus said and did. So when they died as witnesses to what they had seen, heard, and believed, it could be believable. Because we knew that they knew the truth. If Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses or uh, Muslims or, or any other religion today dies for their faith, they can't legitimately say they were there. They know for a fact that what they claim to believe is actually true. The disciples could, and the, and the rest of that 120, among others, who were eyewitnesses. Uh, in the Easter texts, right after Easter, it tells us that Jesus appeared to over 500 people. So, so we're looking at at least 500 who were eyewitnesses of the resurrection of Christ. They could go to their, their deaths with full confidence that what they believed to be true was true, because they'd seen it with their own eyes. Um, that's something that, that no one else can do. I mean, we haven't seen it for ourselves either, which, you know, Peter points out that though we haven't seen in the re earlier text, though you haven't seen, yet you believe. Well, it's true. We haven't seen with our own eyes the resurrection of Christ, but we do have the, uh, the authoritative witness of those who did. Um, and, of course, the Spirit works in our hearts to convince us of that truth and helps us to believe it. So um, this is, just, like I said, this is the continuation of... Persecutions may come, but have no fear of them. And when they come, be prepared to be a martyr for Christ. Uh, continuing on, uh, that, that's a, kind of an introduction to the letter. One key theme in Peter's first letter is that God's people should be holy, which means set apart from the rest of the world and, of course, set apart to God because of what Christ has done for us. Luther's explanation to the second article of the Creed seems to borrow a lot from 1 Peter 1, verses 18 to 19. Uh, let's just read that for now, and then if you can, remember the explanation to the second article. We'll see if we can compare uh, what we read to what we know from confirmation class. 1 Peter verses 18, chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. Knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Okay, thank you. What language from the explanation to the second article of the Creed um, do we see evidenced there, or as the basis for the explanation? Not with perishable things, but with the blood of Christ. Yeah. Right. Um, I, um, I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, beyond the Father, from eternity, also true man, born of Virginia's mother, who has redeemed me, brother, purchased and won me from all sin, from death, and the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood and his innocent suffering and death. Um, so clearly Luther was borrowing that from Peter who talked about how we have been uh, ransomed, redeemed, paid for um, by the precious blood of the Lamb. Basically, Peter's message was this, that since Christ died for us, we should live for him, even if it costs us our lives. And that theme is continued in chapter 4, 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 13 to 19. But rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or a thief, or an evildoer, or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, um, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. This is kind of an important um, reminder for Christians because sometimes Christians are jerks and they do things they shouldn't. And then when people call them on it, they act as some kind of martyr, like they're suffering for Jesus. No, you're suffering because you're a jerk. 
If you're going to suffer, is what Peter's saying, make sure it's for the right reasons. That you are suffering for your faithfulness to God, your obedience to God, not because you've committed some kind of sin. In those cases, you probably deserve to suffer. I'm not, I may be putting words in Peter's mouth there, but if you're going to be a jerk, you should expect negative consequences for that. But that's not how Christians should suffer. If we're going to suffer, it should be from doing good. Um, and, and certainly we have seen that happen uh, for thousands of years now, that Christians have suffered simply for being followers of Christ. And then finally in chapter 5, Peter gave instructions and encouragement to what he called elders, which uh, would also be understood as under-shepherds or as we would call them, pastors. Let's take a look at 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 2 through 4. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingness, willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the fading crown of glory. All right, and that's kind of, thank you, that's kind of where we get the idea of an under-shepherd, is where Peter here talks about the chief shepherd, the head shepherd. You all, pastors, elders, as it's called here, um, you're shepherds, to be sure, God has entrusted his flocks to you, but you're not the chief shepherd. You serve under the chief shepherd. And here we see some of the things that Peter says to those um, who serve in that capacity. If we continue on in chapter 5, starting in verse 5, we see that he also addresses those uh, to whom are ministered to by pastors. What does it say in verses 5 through 10? Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Okay, thank you. Lots to unpack there as we look at that. Uh, first of all, verse 5, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Uh, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility uh, toward one another. God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. Um, you know, uh, pastors are called to tell people what to do in some cases. Mostly told to tell people what Christ has done. Uh, but then the preaching of the law requires that they tell people what to do and what not to do. And it's a pretty human um, response to not like being told what to do. I think I've shared the story with you before. Whenever they've got those signs that tell you your speed limit, I always want to speed up just because. I don't like them. It's my sinful nature, but I don't like them looking at my speed limit and saying, slow down. Anyway, that's dumb, but it's a little confession of mine. And I assume that all of us in some way have... Tracy's laughing because she knows it's true. She's in the car with me every time and just rolls her eyes. Um, it, it's... What? Pretty soon the speed limit 60 and you're going 75. Just as you speed up, just a little more. I'm that kind of idiot that would do that. <laughs> Yeah, anyway, I, I'm not saying everybody is that uh, foolish, but I think all of us have a sinful nature that doesn't like to be told what to do. Um, so the call here is to humble yourselves and, and um, be led by your pastor as, as he calls it repentance, if that may be necessary. And of course, uh, the promise that is given here is um, at the proper time, God will exalt you. You know, you humble yourself to his servant and God will, will uh, lift you up. 
And then they, there is a verse here that um, when, I was, when I was a teacher and would go to um, kids' graduation parties, I always signed this citation in their um, cards that I would give them, 1 Peter 5, 7. Um, if you were isolated by itself and just give it its own context, it would be, cast all your cares on him for he cares for you. It's, it's a wonderful little verse for people all the time, not just at graduation, but to remember, we have a God who loves us. So why would, be, why would we hold back from going to him if there's anything that causes us any kind of anxiety? Um, that's silly. Cast all your cares, your anxieties on him because he cares about you. Then it goes on and gives, gives some other warnings. Uh, be so reminded, be watchful. The devil prowls like a lion seeking someone to, to devour. Um, I think most of us are aware of that, but perhaps sometimes we just sort of forget that he, Satan's in the world. He is active in the world. Him and his demons are engaged in spiritual warfare against Christians and non-Christians alike. I mean, un, uh, unbelievers have already been sort of conquered by him, and he wants to keep it that way. So he's going to work to prevent them from hearing the gospel. And he's going to work to prevent us from bringing it to them, whether that is by creating apathy in us towards unbelievers or putting all kinds of obstacles in our lives uh, that make it difficult. Um, there are times where I believe Christians can suffer as a direct result of, of uh, demonic attacks. Uh, we know the scriptures say they can't kill us, but they can um, affect us if God allows it. Um, that's called a demonic uh, oppression. There's possession, and then there's, maybe it's oppression. Basically, they can mess around with us and make life hard on us if God allows it, um, but they're not allowed, not allowed to kill us. Um, and sometimes I wonder about that, that hardships get brought into our lives. It may not just be bad luck. It could be uh, demonic in origin that um, Satan is doing something to try to harm the church or specific individuals whom he is trying to uh, limit their effectiveness as a missionary for Christ. Uh, when I look at the whole... Um, uh, coronavirus pandemic. I mean, you can see Satan's fingerprints all over it. Not saying he created it, but I am saying that he has used it uh, to harm the church in a variety of different ways, um, to divide people against one another about masks or vaccines or whatever. Um, we, we've seen a lot of that, and we need to remember our enemy is not the person with whom we disagree. It's Satan who's trying to divide us uh, against one another. Um, so whether it's that or, or lots of other things, um, we need to remember we have an actual battle going on. And we're engaged in it whether we know it or not. Um, and that's what Peter is reminding us of here. He is a roaring, a prowling lion. Sorry, not a... Uh, he is a roaring lion, but he's prowling around seeking someone to devour. Um, he is constantly trying to trip us up and deceive us and lead us astray. So verse 9, resist him. Firm in your faith. Faith comes from hearing the word. So be in the word so that your faith can be strengthened. That's what enables you to stand firm against uh, uh, the, the lion that is seeking to devour you. And then Peter also encourages them by reminding them that you're, you're part of the fellowship of, of believers, many of whom are also suffering. You're not alone. And that's not meant to diminish what, what anybody is suffering, but it's to remind them others are suffering too. There is some kind of comfort in knowing you're not alone. That's why we have groups for people who grieve, people who have addictions, people who have suffered at the hands of others. We have groups for that because there is comfort in knowing we don't go through this alone. Other people understand what we're going through. And by the way, just as an aside, um, when Catholics claim that that the, the saints in heaven are praying for us, and that's why we pray to them, so that we can sort of uh, implore them to pray for us. Their argument is, well, we know that the saints are praying for us. How will they know what to pray for unless we tell them? Well, I think Peter makes it pretty clear here. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to know that in North Korea right now, there are Christians who fear for their lives. I don't know a single one of them by name, but I know that they're, they're in that situation. And in various African and Asian countries, same thing. 
I don't know any of them by name, but I know that they're suffering. I know that they are under constant threat of death. So I pray for them. <laughs> it's the same thing with the saints in heaven. How do they know we're suffering on earth? Because they suffered on earth. I mean, not every saint in heaven necessarily was persecuted, but they all saw the work of, of the devil and his servants in our world making life tough on Christians. They didn't have to see it firsthand to know that it happens. Uh, Peter is kind of reminding us of that here. We know that people are suffering is what Peter's saying. There are people suffering all over the place. So, you know, be encouraged to know you're not alone. You share fellowship with them throughout the world. And, and that's what the saints in heaven are doing for us now. Whether they went through martyrdom or whether they didn't, they certainly know the conditions of this world, so they pray for us. We don't have to tell them what to pray for. They already know, and that's what they are praying for. That whole text, uh, which is in Revelation, about the saints offering up prayers for us, it's in the context of the, the, the daily battles between Satan and us that are going on. So they know, and that's what they're praying for. Uh, anyway, I, it's kind of an aside, but it's worth noting that the saints in heaven who are offering prayers for us don't have to see us directly to know what to, to pray for. Yes? Where's, the, where's that in Scripture where, you, where the saints are praying for us? It's in Revelation. I don't know the exact chapter off the top of my head, um, but I know that we covered it when we went through the book of Revelation a while back. Um, and since I happen to live with you, I can help you find it later on today. If anyone else wants to know, I'll have to call you. <laughs> Okay, um, let's move on. Uh, take special note of the two comments made in verse 13. Oops, I haven't got that far yet, have we? No, we didn't. Um, so we read 5 to 10, um, and now it's saying, take special note of two comments that are made in 1 Peter uh, chapter 5, verse 13. She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings, and so does Mark, my son. Man, there is a lot of stuff to unpack in that one verse. She who is at Babylon, who is she? Christians? Yes, the church. She, the bride of Christ. That's why the church, among other th reasons, is referred to as she, because we are the bride of Christ. So she, the church, who is at Babylon. What's Babylon? From Revela Revelation uses that term a number of times to describe a place. Not, not actual Babylon. It's symbolic for a different place. Any guesses? Well, this is this, these are final greetings from Peter. So she who is in Babylon, where was Peter at the time? Rome. Rome. Rome is the Babylon that is mentioned in Revelation and also here. So she, the church, who is in Rome, who is likewise chosen, in other words, God's people, sends you greetings, and so does Mark, my son. Who's Mark? It's John Mark, the one who abandoned Paul, and Paul said, forget it, I don't trust you, you can't come back and go on missionary journeys with me. Also for whom this church is named after, Mark. And how, what does Peter say about him? My son. When we look at Mark's gospel, um, it is assumed that he got his information, obviously inspired by the Holy Spirit, uh, from Peter. He was with Peter. Peter took him under his wing. When Peter traveled for at least a time, Mark went with him. Uh, so what we know and understand about Mark is that his gospel is probably based on the eyewitness testimony of Peter. It also shares a lot in common with Matthew. There could be a variety of reasons for that, which I'm not going to get into now. But that's the mark that, uh, that Peter is mentioning here. And so where is Mark? If he is sending greetings from Mark or on behalf of Mark, Mark must have been 
in Rome it, with, with Peter in Rome. Whether he was accompanying Peter still, or whether he came to visit him, as you know, by this time Mark has rehabilitated and is a, a faithful servant of the church once more. But here in the closing greetings to the first letter that Peter wrote, we get a few things that are worth noting. Okay, Second Peter. In his second letter to Christians, Peter warned them of a different threat. Previously, he had warned them about the persecutions that were coming. But in his second letter, he wanted to warn them about the threats that would arise from inside the church. So the church is attacked from without and from within. From without, uh, meaning outside of the church, by persecutions and enemies of the church, etc., etc. But also within the church, there are enemies who seek to uh, destroy it, divide it, and tear it apart. Uh, from among those who called themselves Christians, false teachings, heresies, were beginning to emerge. So Peter began his second letter by making it clear what the basis for truth was, God's word. He reminded them that the writings of the apostles and prophets were not the words of men, but the very words of God. Not only that, some of them, including Peter himself, were eyewitnesses of the things that they wrote about. So now we turn to 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 to 21. If somebody would read that, please. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses to his, of his majesty. <clears throat> For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice of, was borne to him in, by the majest, majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from, he born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain, and we have some, something more sure, the prophetic word to which you will do well to pay attention, as a lamp of of shining in the dark place until the day is dawn and the morning star rises in our hearts. Knowing this first of all, that the prophecy in the scripture co comes from someone's own, no prophecy of the scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For, own, for no pro prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Spirit. Okay, thank you. Uh, so here Peter in his second letter uh, mentions the fact that what we know what we're talking about because we were eyewitnesses. This uh, time when God the Father spoke from heaven uh, in majestic glory and said, this is my beloved son. Uh, when was that? There were two times. He's referencing one of them. What were the two times where God said that? Baptism, Baptism Transfiguration. and Transfiguration. Which one is Peter referring to? Transfiguration. Transfiguration, because he said it happened on the mountain, uh, the holy mountain. So we were there. We heard the voice. And not only heard the voice, they saw Elijah and Moses. I mean, that's pretty good confirmation that we're dealing with the Son of God. <clears throat> um, and, and then he goes on at the end of that to say that uh, the words of Scripture are, were not produced by men who sat down with a quill and an ink uh, well and said, hmm, what should I write about? They were inspired by the Holy Spirit to write. They were carried along by the Holy Spirit to write what God wanted them to write. Uh, and so even Peter, as he's writing, recognizes, well, it's not like he sat down to write something, and it was his idea. The Spirit called him, urged him, inspired him to write uh, the letter that he was writing. <clears throat> I have a... I have a yeah, please. I, I, I just want to make sure I'm thinking of the right Peter. This is Peter who was also called Simon, correct? 
Yes. Andrew's brother? Yes. Okay, just making sure. The apostle. Yep. Okay. There, I think there was only one Peter. There were two Simons. Yes. But this okay. is Simon Peter. Okay. Just wanted to make sure. Thank you. Sure. All right, moving on, next paragraph. After establishing that God's word was the source of truth, Peter warns them about the false prophets, teachers who have come along and will continue to come, trying to deceive the church. And then Peter warns them what will happen to those false teachers and all who follow them. They will be condemned to hell. Uh, so the point, obviously, and remember, this was written for confirmants, so this is really helpful encouragement for them. The point is to know your Bible, so that false teachers can't trick you into believing something false. Uh, let's take a look at what it says in 2 Peter 2, verses 1 to 3. <clears throat> Many will follow their sensuality. What do you suppose Peter's referencing there? And let me just clear up, it's not having to do with sex. When he says they follow their sensuality, what is he saying? Their own mind thinking. Yeah, keep going. Their feelings? Their feelings. When we talk about sensuality in the romantic realm, it has to do with how you feel about a person, how they make you feel. That's what Peter is saying. People will rely on feelings, uh, and that will be their downfall. Um, and then those who bring those heresies about um, will, will be doing it for greed. And they will exploit you. So, in other words, if somebody is saying these false things, why? Are they doing it because they genuinely believe they're right? And they want to correct you? Or, do they know it's wrong, but there's no profit in following along, but if they say something separate and different, now there's something in it for them. And maybe the greed simply has to do with they want attention and power, not necessarily money. But we, we, we should understand there's a difference between people who genuinely believe something about Scripture and they're wrong. Um, for, and, you know, that's still wrong. Uh, we still should correct that. But that's different from somebody who knows they're wrong and they're going to say it anyway because they want to exploit you. Um, Joel Osteen comes to mind. He doesn't know any more about the Bible than confirmation kids uh, before they're confirmed. Um, he is just telling people what they want to hear, and he exploits it so he can gain a lot of wealth. 
Um, he's not the only one. He's just an easy one to pick on because he's so well known. But that would be an example of someone inside the church who is literally destroying it, or at least trying to, for his own personal gain. Anyway, I could go on, I won't, but um, beware of those um, wolves in sheep clothing, so to speak. Um, they are the ones who know they're wrong, but don't care. They're exploiting the sheep. Peter ends his second letter by reminding Christians that the day of the Lord is coming. Uh, the day of the Lord is another way of saying the last day or judgment day. Uh, he told them that it won't come right away or even as quickly as they would want. And while they wait for that day to come, many will mock and tease them. All right, so we look at 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 to 7. This is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandments of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, knowing this first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days, with scoffing following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. So, uh, just going that far so far, bear in mind there's going to be people who are going to scoff at your faith. They're going to try to undermine your faith. And what will they point to? They will point to the fact that he said he was coming. Where is he? He said he was coming back soon. He's not here. So that just goes to show that your belief is in vain. You're silly for believing it. So Peter's warning them ahead of time that people will uh, use that against them, that Christ hasn't returned, therefore you shouldn't believe what he says. Um, verse 5, For they deliberately overlooked this fact, that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the, of the ungodly. <clears throat> Excuse me again. Allergy stuff. It's hard to get that out of there. Anyway, they deliberately um, ignore the fact that God has already proven who he is by creation. He created the world in the beginning. Uh, what was the earth? Formless and void, but it was also filled with water. Uh, God made land come out of the water, but the water was already there. So uh, we have an earth churning with water everywhere, and then God created out of that. But then later God destroyed, once again using water. Um, and, and so Peter's saying they deliberately overlooked that fact that God has already proven his existence. Uh, so our faith in that God is not silly. God's already proven who he is through what he has already done. Um, so as you're waiting and you're being mocked, this is what Peter then says. Do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the day one day with the Lord one day as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that each should reach repentance. There's a few verses in the Bible that are constantly taken out of context and used to promote things that they never said. This is one of them. For with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day. How do you suppose that that text is misused by some Christians in the world today? It's been over a thousand years. Why hasn't he come yet? Okay, yeah, that, that's one. But that's not, that's not a false thing. That's true. He hasn't come back. How is it used falsely? Creation in the fifth place in the sixth consecutive day. Yeah, those Christians that want to believe the Bible, but this creates a problem for them, use this text to reconcile and say, well, evolution is possible because with the, day, uh, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years. So that first day could have been like a million years. It could have been a billion years. That's baloney. And it's baloney for lots of reasons. But the first thing we can point to is that's not anything that Peter's talking about. He's not talking about the days of creation. What is he talking about? What is the context? And you, you touched on it already. What's the context of him saying a day is like a thousand years to the Lord? 
God's timing. God's timing. Jesus said, surely I'm coming soon. soon. Well, it's been thousands of years. What do you mean soon? Ah, soon for God isn't necessarily soon for us. Just like when Christmas is coming soon for the parents, a couple months, that's just fine. For kids, ah, when is it coming? That's not soon enough. I need it today. Different ideas of time. So the context is, if you're impatient with God's coming and you're starting to doubt because he said soon, just remember, God's soon is not going to be the same as your soon. That's the context. It has nothing to do with creation. But people who want to accept evolution will try to torture this text so that it somehow addresses creation uh, and evolution. And, and I could go at great length, but let me just keep it as simple as possible. At the end of the first day, there was evening, there was morning, the first day. There was evening, there was morning, the second day. Okay? These are days as we understand them. It wasn't a million years of night and then a million years of daylight the first day. That, that's not at all consistent with anything the scriptures have ever said. And the, the story of creation is pretty straightforward. There's not a lot of symbolism there. It, it's speaking very directly about what God did. There was evening, there was morning, the first day. And, and all the other reasons that I won't go into right now indicate it was six 24-hour periods of time that were discussed. Uh, like I said, I could say more, but I won't. Just suffice to say... That is not what this text is about, and shame on them for, for trying to make it so. Um, let's see, where else do we have? But Christians should know there is a reason why God doesn't come back right away. He wants to give people more time to believe in Him and be saved. That's what we heard as we look back at this text, text from 2 Peter chapter 3. It continues on in 8 and 9. Do not overlook this fact, beloved. I already read this once. Um, the Lord is, verse 9, the Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some of you count slowness, but is patient toward you. Not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. The reason God hasn't come back yet is because you haven't finished your work. He's being patient with you to finish what he's called you to do, which is go, make disciples. go and make disciples of all nations. Now, people have said this. I'm not saying I agree, but they're take it for what it, what it will. When the, the gospel has been preached to the whole world, then the Lord will return. I don't know if that's true. I tend to think that it's not necessarily true because nobody knows the timing. But as it says in the text here, God is patient because he wants more people to have the opportunity to hear the gospel and be saved. So in the meantime, we have to suffer while that, that work of, of evangelism continues to be ongoing. If we want to speed things up, I'm not saying this, but they would, then tell more people. That'll get, you know, once it's out there and everybody has had a chance to hear it, then the Lord doesn't have to be patient anymore. Now he can come back. I don't know if that's true or not. Just I offer that for you to consider as a possibility. But the point is that God is patient because he wants people to have the opportunity to be saved. Uh, notice how time is described by Peter, and we've already covered that stuff. So now let's skip on to Jude, because I know we're short on time a little bit. Uh, the book of Jude is really just a short letter. It doesn't even have chapters. So instead of citing chapters and verses, we simply cite the verse. For example, Jude 2 says, Mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. Uh, so let's read Jude 1 and 2, which comes after John's letters. Jude and servant of Jesus Christ, and brother of David, those who are called to love in God the Father and kept in Jesus Christ. May first mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. All right, thank you. Uh, Jude was written by another one of Jesus' brothers. Uh, James was the other brother of Jesus that's cited here. Jude, a servant of Jesus and brother of James. Uh, so Jude is trying to point out the fact of who he is. He's identifying himself by saying he's a brother of Jesus. Um, a servant, I'm sorry, a servant of Jesus and a brother of James. Well, this isn't Jude, the brother of James and John, because he's nowhere else referred to as that. Where is James referred to uh, besides the brother of John? The only other James that would be noteworthy in the New Testament would be the brother of Jesus, who became the leader of the Christian church in Jerusalem. So which one of these is Jude? Well, he's probably referring to James, the brother of Jesus. 
Um, otherwise, uh, the sons of Zebedee, James and John, were pretty well known. He would have said brother of James and John instead of just James. So when he says just James, he's referring to James everybody would know. Um, so this is what I was writing here in the handout. It is not universally accepted that Jude was the brother of Jesus. However, no one has come up with a better explanation for Jude's opening statement. In those days, James was a Jewish name. So was Jude. So if I wrote a letter and said, um, this is Bob, you know me, I'm, I'm Bill's friend. That wouldn't necessarily be very helpful because there's a lot of Bobs and Bills in the world. So it would have to be a specific Bob or a specific Bill that everybody would know in order for us to understand that. Uh, so the authorship of Jude would have been a mystery to its readers unless the reference to a James was one that everyone would know. In other words, Jude wouldn't have referred to James unless everybody knew which James he was talking about. And since James was the likely brother of Jesus and leader of the church in Jerusalem, that would make Jude his biological brother. Why didn't Jude refer to his family connection to Jesus? What did he call himself? Not the brother of Jesus, but the servant. Why would Jude refer to the fact that he's a servant? Maybe he was being modest and didn't want to use Jesus' name for his own personal gain. Or maybe he was humble because he was ashamed of the fact that no one in Jesus' family believed in him at first. If you don't know that story, it's recorded in one of the Gospels where Jesus was preaching in the temple, or maybe it was a synagogue, and they were trying to get him out of there because they thought he was crazy. You're, you're talking crazy talk. People are going to do something to you. we got to get you out of here. Um, so they didn't believe in him at first. Either way, he referred to a different kind of connection uh, to Jesus than brother. All right, last paragraph. Jude began his letter by saying that he would have preferred to write to them about the good news of the Gospel. But since a false teaching had sprung up, which was distorting the gospel, Jude wrote to them about that instead. Uh, we look at verses 3 and 4. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our Master and Lord Jesus Christ. So the, we, we get the sense they're sneaking. The, the, it's not obvious that, that these are heretics. Um, they, snap, they snuck in unnoticed. Um, they're ungodly. They pervert the grace of God into sensuality. Once again, we see that word come up. People relying on feelings rather than God's word. Feelings come from where? Where do your feelings come from? Inside of you, right? Where does God's word come to you? Outside of you. It's objective versus your feelings are subjective. That's one of the reasons why Christians, I'm sorry, Lutherans, uh, at least Missouri Synod Lutherans and Wisconsin Synod Lutherans, are, are hesitant whenever people start talking about the Spirit speaking to us and God talked to me and, and you know I have this feeling. We're pretty cautious about those things because we recognize we're sinful creatures. So if something comes to us from inside of us, like that little voice that speaks to us, maybe it's not God. There's other stuff in there that can come out. Those feelings that people may have aren't necessarily what God wants us to feel because we're sinful by nature. But the Word, on the other hand, is objective. It is what it is, and we know that it's inspired by God. So that gives it its power, and that gives it its authority. So we place that authority certainly over any feelings a person might have. Um, Jude wrote to warn them that some false teachers were telling them that they could do whatever things they wanted since they were already forgiven. That is a terrible misunderstanding and distortion of the gospel. And anyone who believed it was putting their very salvation in danger. And we talked about that before. Other uh, New Testament writers have addressed the same issue, uh, including Paul, who, who just points out the fact that just because you're saved and your sins are forgiven, even before you commit them, does not mean, well, heck, go commit a bunch of sins and you're, you're able to do that with no fear. That is not the intention of the gospel is to make you more comfortable in your sin. And so we see Jude addresses that again. It's amazing how many different New Testament writers were concerned about that issue. And then we look at the world going on around us today, even amongst Christians, and we see, oh, yeah, I guess that is something we need to hear still today, even, because we are tempted to use God's grace as license to sin even more. Uh, uh, then 
Jude ends the letter by reminding them that the apostles had already warned them about these false teachers, and he encourages them to remain faithful to God. Verses 17 to 23. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. Well, Peter wrote that, among others. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people, devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in the most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Uh, so, again, more advice for Christians, how they should live and relate to others during these end times in which we are now living. Any closing questions or comments? So what's the difference between the final reading and the doxology? The doxology is generally, and I'm not even looking at the text anymore, so hopefully this, this agrees, the doxology is... Uh, statement of praise to God, giving thanks to God. Um, so when we sing the doxology, we sing praise God from whom all bless. Okay, so you get the idea. Um, so that wouldn't necessarily be the same as sending greetings. But without looking at the text in front of me, I can't say for sure that that's the case here in Jude. Does that fit with what Jude wrote? Or is he continuing to send greetings even in the doxology? So, so dox, the doxology, at least here in Jude, is praising God. Okay, well, that's good. That's always good advice. Anything else? Okay, Matt's got nothing, so I guess we can go. Have a blessed week, everyone.